Well, good morning. <laughs> our text this morning for our message is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, verses 2 through 9. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Word of the Lord. There was an elderly woman who was at the funeral of her husband in the church. Uh, she and her family were seated along the first set of pews. Not too far away from her was the open casket of her husband. Well, the service began with a hymn and then a prayer, and the pastor got up, and he began to uh, deliver a, a beautiful little elaborate, extremely complimentary eulogy. He spoke of the husband's love for his family, the church, and his fellow person. Where are we sitting? Here? He went on to tell how good, humble, honest, hardworking, and generous the husband had been to his family. And with that, the lady looked at her little granddaughter sitting next to her, tapped her, and said, Sweetheart, Real quietly, go over and look in that casket and see if that's really your granddaddy. <laughs> well, you know, these letters of Paul that we, we read from in the Bible, they're, so, they're the scripture, and, and uh, uh, you have to remember something, though. We have the ability to read. We have them in writing. Uh, the people at... Corneth only had one copy, so it was read to them. So they were all gathered, many of them at one time. They were gathered, and they were listening to someone read this. And, and they had to be thinking from this uh, introduction of Paul's, uh, does he really know us? <laughs> you know, I mean, is he talking about us? But Paul did know them. He knew them very well. You see, Paul had first come to Corneth in uh, 50 A.D., he spent the next 18 months there preaching and teaching and helping them to develop a faith, a faith in Jesus Christ that would see them through. And he knew they had a, a good foundation. Well, he also knew that there were serious problems challenging these new Christians. Paul had received word from some of the uh, Corinthian church leaders asking for clarification on a number of issues. Among them uh, was baptism, questions about marriage, eating food that was sacrificed to idols, the role of women in the church. These things were causing confusion and conflict. But there were also some very disturbing reports that the Corinthian church was experiencing divisions and breakaways and that there was unequal treatment of people of lower status at the celebration of the common meal. The common meal back at that time was a meal. It was a meal, but now it's, our, it's a meal. It's our Holy Communion. Members were not getting along. They were suing one another in the public courts. There was also quiet acceptance of sexual immorality among the members. People would just turn their head and they wouldn't say anything. There was no accountability. Well, Paul would address these and other issues later in the letter. He also understood, he also understood the culture that 
the Corinthians were living in, the Christians. You see, Corinth, Corinth was destroyed, oh, about a little over 100 years before Christ. But Julius the Caesar, Julius Caesar decided he was going to rebuild Corinth because it was a, a, a seaport, very valuable seaport at one time, and a military advantage and everything else. So he, he began a rebuilding of the city, and he made it a Roman colony. And he, now we're talking about 55 AD, so it's been around about 100 years, and it's really grown a lot of people. There's Romans living there. Since it was a Roman colony, they, they came to make their, make their fortune. And then you also had Greeks. Corinth was in uh, Achaia, which uh, is now modern-day Greece. So you had the Greeks coming in from different places, you know, migrating in. You also had a few Jews coming uh, from the, because of the diaspora. Well... What happened, though, was as the Romans came in, they brought their worship of the emperor and, and the worship of their false gods, and so did the Greeks. They brought in their false gods. It said that you couldn't walk down the streets in Corinth very far before you would see uh, statues, idols dedicated to the, the gods of love, war, wealth, most of the other worldly uh, obsessions. The city also had over a dozen, a dozen uh, uh, pagan temples. And believe it or not, these temples employed over a thousand prostitutes. Now, the prevailing attitude among the people was that, well, look, life is short. This is all you get. You only go around once, so you grab what you can, enjoy it, and that's the way many, many of them lived. Now, you know what, <laughs> when you think about it, that we're surrounded today by people who are worshiping false gods, um, not necessarily statues or things like that, but they're worshiping the false gods of success, materialism, money, status, popularity, even sexual immorality. That's just a few. Now, such pursuits as that can can lead to choices and behaviors that destroy families, lead to crime and violence and greed and addiction and consequently ruin lives. Well, and today, you know what? We have problems in our churches too. In the, the church universal, but many local congregations are struggling for one, one problem or another. A lot of factions, a lot of splitting away of, of congregations from each other. Now, what's interesting to note about this letter is that when Paul wrote this, it's almost 2,000 years ago when he wrote this, he wrote it and addressed it, maybe you missed it, he addressed it to everyone. Listen to this. He began, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, that means made holy, in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. This is the only letter in the Bible written by St. Paul that is addressed to all Christians. All of his other letters, Ephesians, Colossians, so forth, are addressed to that particular congregation or at least that area. Now, they were meant to be circulated, but Paul made a point. Why? Because he knew. The Holy Spirit inspired him to recognize that the problems that they're facing, we're going to face later on. There's going to be divisions. There's going to be uh, disappointments. There are disappointments in behavior and so forth. And everyone is not going to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, instead of jumping in and, and uh, addressing these problems right away, he will get to that. I mean, as soon as verse 10 comes, uh, he gets to it. And that's the rest of his letter pretty much is addressing problems and situations. But he begins with these first verses as 
words of encouragement. And he does it by giving thanks. He begins, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Now, we know what grace is. Most of us are familiar with that couple verses out of uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, where Paul describes it this way. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Paul emphasized grace. He emphasized Jesus Christ and the cross. Grace is that unmerited, unearned love that God has for you, for me, for every individual. Whether they're here, whether they're in China, whether they're in South America, wherever. Everyone. God has love for. Great love. So much love that he sent his son into the world to bring people back to him. Because with sin, we separated ourselves from God. And the penalty for being separated from God is, is death, eternal separation. But God loved us so much that he sent his son. His son came into this world as a, a tiny human and grew to be a, a perfect and precious individual that willingly went to the cross and gave himself as a sacrifice so that our sins could be paid for. Sometimes we just don't grasp the love that God has for us. That's that grace. And let's face it, we're still sinners. We're forgiven sinners. But, but, we will be forgiven for once and for all when Christ returns. Okay. Next, Paul goes on to point out that the Corinthians have been enriched with great spiritual gifts. And he says this, he says, the possession of these gifts of the Holy Spirit is evidence. It's evidence of Christ's work among you. I mean, if they couldn't have had these gifts, these gifts, if, if Christ wasn't working in them, that their faith wasn't there, and that he was replying to the faith. Okay, well, what is this idea of uh, kinds of speech and knowledge? Well, there's many gifts, and we're going to go into them real briefly here in a minute. And Paul will eventually, as I say, he'll, he'll get into correcting the incorrect behavior. But one of the things that was going on that, was, that prompted Paul to write this letter was that there were some people in the congregation of the Corinthians, and it was a mixture. Some of them were, uh, 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 let's say, well-to-do, a few of them anyway. Some of them were craftsmen, and uh, uh, there were also working people. Many of them were working people. Many were slaves. They, they only knew what Paul had taught and what the other leaders had been teaching. There was no written scripture. They may have had some pieces of paper that was passed around, or scrolls. Well, there were some who were gifted with, let's say, um, philo uh, philosophical ideas, uh, something to, especially the Greeks. And there were a few of them who were taking their ideas, <clears throat> and they were twisting, twisting the, uh, the gospel to say something that they wanted it to say. And then they passed that on to people who didn't know any better, and that, they then became a, a separate group. They, they would follow that person, and that was the problem. There was these little groups, and some of them were way out of line. Well, Paul's going to correct that, okay? But he wants to emphasize, because they have these gifts, he says this, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Paul's talking to everybody, including us. And this text is really fitting for, for Advent, the first Sunday in Advent. It's, it begins a new church year. On this first Sunday, the text that are prescribed for us, 
gospel as well as the, uh, as the epistle lessons, they point us towards the, the celebration of Christ's birth coming into the world. It's that infant, child, but it's God in the flesh. It points us to prepare for that worship. But it also, equally essential to our faith, is that it has us look forward to Christ's return. When Christ returns, he's going to be revealed. Not as a child anymore. He's not going to come back as a child. His true identity will be very apparent. He'll come back as the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He'll come back in all of his power, all of his majesty, and all of his glory. And he will come back as the judge of the living and the dead. Now, in order to equip us believers, while we wait for him to return, now it's been almost 2,000 years, but he's coming back. He's coming back. And I will tell you from indications in this world today, it may be rather soon. But he's coming back. And whether... Whether or not you and I are alive when he comes back or we're already up there with him, chances are pretty good I'll be there. Uh, again, it's grace, it's grace, it's not me. But we, each and every one of us, will stand before Jesus Christ as our judge. Now, that could be pretty scary if you didn't have grace, if you didn't know him. But meanwhile, though, when time goes on, eh, the urgency kind of wears off. That's why Paul says you need to wait eagerly. Eagerly is not sitting around twiddling your thumbs. No. So he has given us. He has given us spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts to, to enable us to endure until Christ returns. Now, these are gifts that are granted to each and every one of us. We all have at least one. I think most of us have more than one. The gifts are not for selfish use. They're not uh, to be some source of, of pride on our part, but they're for service to God and to service to one another. Now, Paul, later on in, in the letter, he will list 13 different gifts. We go further in the New Testament, which I did, and came up with 21 gifts. And uh, that's kind of what most people identify. Now, these aren't in any particular order. I'm just going to read them to you as I found them and not make a lot of comment. But I want you to, as you listen, where do you fit here? Or which ones do you have? Put it that way. Wisdom, knowledge, faith. We all have faith. We, otherwise, we couldn't be Christians, right? We're saved by our faith. Gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. And then he mentions people uh, who are individuals that are gifted. They're gifted by the Holy Spirit for certain, uh, certain activities. Apostles, teachers, helpers, administrators, evangelists, pastors. Yeah, we're gifts, okay? <laughs> you can't return us, you can retire us, but you can't return us, okay. Okay, other gifts. Serving, encouraging, giving, leadership, showing mercy, hospitality. Now, you hear that list, you say, oh, come on now. People really have the gift of, of healing? I mean, like Oral Roberts, was that for real? I mean, really? Yes, yes. Not very many. Name one. I will. Dr. Ben Carson. I read his autobiography a long time ago. It's called Gifted Hands. And in that autobiography, he tells you where his gift came from. It was God. Okay. And this, this pandemic we just went through, boy, we, we came to recognize the gift of healing that so many people had and gave so much of to us. I'm talking about the, the doctors, the nurses, the aides, the technicians, uh, the, the first responders, all of these people who helped us through that terrible ordeal of the pandemic. Look, each one of us has a gift, at least one gift of the Holy Spirit. 
The basic gift of faith enables us to, to receive Jesus Christ. But faith comes, as all gifts do, in certain levels. The gift of faith that enables us to endure persecution for being Christians is a higher level of faith. The faith to endure beatings, torture, and death, that's, that's the, not the highest level of the gift of faith. The important truth is that all good gifts, abilities, talents, you could even say skills, they're gifts of the Holy Spirit. When we use our gifts properly in serving God in one another, the Holy Spirit can empower us to overcome, overcome the culture that surrounds us, to overcome the devil and all of his workings that are going on around us, to overcome the challenges of living with people who are non-Christians and the opportunity to witness to them. Well, Paul wraps up his thanksgiving with the assurance that God is faithful, who's called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, when we are baptized, we receive basically three gifts. First of all, forgiveness of sin. Second, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Third, we're made members of the church, the church universal, the Christian church. Not just this one. This is a real blessing here. And as members of the church, we are members of God's family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's how we should treat one another, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, some of them may not treat us as brothers and sisters, but that's, that's immaterial. We treat them that way. That's the only way they're going to learn is by our example. Now, I want to tell you something. I can't Thank God enough for this church. We've been blessed for over 150 years by members, young, old, who use their gifts, their talents, their abilities to, in service to God and, and to each other and to the community. The proof of that is that we've been here for 150 years, starting in a little wooden church that burned down, another one that burned down, and here we are today in this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. It's proof that we've had those gifts. And the Holy Spirit working through the members of Trinity, we have been the physical, the physical body of Jesus Christ in this community and even further. That's what we're to be. That's We're the body of Christ, the physical body. We have the Holy Spirit within us. And then we have gifts of the Spirit to enable us to not just endure, but to, to witness, to help others come to know Jesus Christ. My, my friends, the, the problem is that everyone who has their gifts isn't working, isn't helping. I read something, some, some cynic wrote not, not too long ago. He compared church to uh, a football game. He said, church is like a football game. There are thousands of people in the stands who are desperately in need of, of exercise. And out on the field, there are 22 people that are desperately in need of rest. <laughs> kind of looks a little bit like us at times. You know, we always talk about the 80% that aren't Helping the 20% that are? I like to think there's more than that here, but there's still some that can do more. Some haven't done a whole lot. Or, but we have the gifts, and we have that call. We have the call from Jesus Christ himself. It's called the Great Commission, and you're familiar with it. It's in Matthew 28. Jesus gave this commission to his disciples who became his apostles, and that's us now. He gave this commission to them as he was ascended into heaven. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, that's all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. 
Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You and I openly living out our faith by word and by deed may be the final call to faith in Jesus Christ that some people will get. Okay? I don't know if I've ever said this before. I'll say it right real quick now. As a very young minister, I was called to the bedside of a dying woman. She had hours to live. And I, she wasn't a member of the church or anything else. But I, I, I don't know. The Spirit prompted me to say to her, uh, and I, what do you say? You don't say, how you doing? She's dying. I looked at her and I said, do you believe in eternal life? And she said, huh? What's that? And I talked to her for the next several minutes about Jesus Christ. And she received Jesus Christ. If I had not done that, if somebody hadn't done that, Perhaps she wouldn't, would not have left this earth knowing Jesus Christ. Look, whether Jesus returns in our lifetime or not, whether we go to meet him, one day each and every one of us, you and me, we're going to stand before Jesus as the judge of the living and the dead. Now look, we don't have to, we don't have to be afraid of that judgment. We're saved by grace. We didn't earn it. We, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's the love of God. We're saved by grace if we believe in Jesus Christ. Now, if we believe in Jesus Christ, where our lives are going to show it. To some extent, it's going to show it. And we will indeed, we'll, we indeed will we'll seek to use those gifts, those talents, and, and all the... God has given us to do his will, obey his commandments, strive to follow Jesus' example ourselves and to help others to do that. Now, we don't do that out of fear of going to hell for, for eternity. We don't do that out of fear. But we do it, we do it out of love and out of gratitude to Jesus Christ. If we really believe that someone gave his life for, for us, wouldn't it be a Appropriate to give back to him love and obedience? Look, my friends, whatever, whatever challenges, difficulties, problems, persecution we may face on our brief time here on earth, remember something. God has all eternity to make it up to us. And this was just an organ blick. The blink of an eye when it comes to eternity. St. John in his book of Revelation gives us some glimpses of heaven. In chapter 21 is, is just one of those little glimpses describing what Jesus has prepared for us and those who trust in him. John writes, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Listen, brothers and sisters, listen. We don't have to fear standing for, before Jesus on Judgment Day. We don't, we don't have to fear that. Instead, let us work. Let us work together until he does come. So that by the grace of God, when we stand before Jesus for that judgment, we don't have to fear anything. But what we can do is we can anticipate and yearn for his verdict of well done, good and faithful servants. Amen. Amen. Oh. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, you have promised to return from your throne in heaven. To return as our Savior, but also our Judge. 
Until then, grant us the power of your Holy Spirit to let our light so shine that others may see in us something that they want and need, not just for December 25th, but for eternity. It's in your name we pray. Amen. To heal my heart, you changed my name.